A few years ago, a man was speeding down the highway, heading for the airport to catch his flight. Soon there were red lights flashing behind him, and the police officer pulled him over and uh, then took his time writing out the ticket, even though the man kept protesting he was in a hurry. When he finally arrived at the airport, he parked the car and ran into the terminal, <laughs> only to realize that he had left his briefcase in the trunk. So he quickly returned to the car, uh, grabbed it, uh, ran back into the terminal, hurried to get through security. When he reached the checkout counter, the man told him he was too late to board the flight. And so he tried to argue with the attendant, but as he was doing so, the plane began to taxi down the runway. And he also learned it would be at least five hours before he could catch another flight. So he spent the next three hours waiting very impatiently until he saw some horrible news on the television screen. There had just been a plane crash. The flight he was scheduled to take had crashed and did not appear to be any survivors. Friends, that is what I would call a blessing in disguise. You know, life often has challenges or problems, and we get so uh, irritated or, or frustrated, and yet after a period of time, we see, we, we sometimes realize that we've actually benefited from what had seemed like a very unpleasant situation. I think almost all of us have had those type of experiences, uh, probably not as dramatic as missing a, a flight that, that crashed. However, we have learned that situations which are initially disappointing may end up being a source of joy. And, and we've also figured out that sometimes things which we welcome can end up being, well, <laughs> a disaster. Friends, this morning our journey through the Gospel of Luke brings us to chapter 6, verses 17 through 26. And if you have your Bible, please turn there. Luke chapter 6, 17 through 26, page 862, if you're using the black one in the rack, 862, Luke 6, 17 through 26. Here we find Jesus teaching his disciples, uh, including those of us at Chisholm Baptist Church, this important truth. Blessings, those things which bring us real joy, often show up at our door in disguise. And it can take some time before we recognize them as blessings. At the same time, things which will bring trouble into, into our lives often show up disguised as innocent or even glamorous, and we welcome those things. Friends, today I, I believe God wants us to use what Jesus teaches in this passage to help us see through the disguises of different situations we face in life so that we would be able to discern what will bring us joy, what will bring true joy into our lives. And and let's just pause and pray the Lord would use his word to cause that to happen this morning. Thank you, Father, for the Bible, the word of God. Thank you, Lord, that you are the God who speaks to us. And this morning we desire that we would hear your voice and understand what you're saying, that we would believe what you're saying, and by your grace we would obey it. In Jesus' name and for his sake, amen. Luke chapter 6, starting with verses 17 through 19. After coming down with them, he stood on a level place. Jesus stood on a level place with a large crowd of his disciples and a great number of people from all over Judea and Jerusalem and from the seacoast of Tyre and Sidon. They came to hear him and be healed of their diseases. And those tormented by unclean spirits were made well. The whole crowd was trying to touch him because, because power was coming out from him and healing them all. <laughs> Pretty amazing situation. 
And yet, as we go through Luke chapter 6, we're going to find there are many similarities to Matthew chapters 5 through 7, which is usually called Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. So note, right at the beginning, Luke says that Jesus had come down to a level place, or other versions say to a plain. And some suggest Jesus is really on a high plateau, which could be described as both a, a mountain or a, a level place, and that uh, Matthew and Luke are describing the same event. Yet I think these are two different settings. As a traveling teacher, Jesus likely repeated his, his sermons a, a variety of times. I know when I was at North Star Church in Virginia on March 11th, I preached a very similar message to what I had given here in Chisholm on February 25th, but certainly two different occasions. And thus the, the differences between the Beatitudes found in Matthew chapter 5 and the Beatitudes in our text today, those difference, differences are not because Matthew or Luke failed to give an accurate report on what Jesus said. Rather, they each describe a, a separate sermon, and inspired by the Holy Spirit, I'm confident they each provide a trustworthy and authoritative record of Jesus' teaching on that particular occasion. Okay, let's look at the disguised blessings Jesus describes. Incidentally, when Jesus says bless, or a lot of times people say blessed, uh, it, it could also be translated as happy. And yet the happiness to which Jesus is referring is not a, a giddiness, but a much deeper joy. Verse 20. Then looking up at his disciples, Jesus said, Blessed are you who are poor, because the kingdom of God is yours. Uh, blessed are you who are, are not hungry, because you will be filled. Uh, blessed are you who weep now, because you will laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you, when they exclude you, insult you, and slander your name as evil because of the Son of, of Man. Re rejoice in that day and, and leap for joy. Take note. Your reward is great in heaven, for this is the way, way their ancestors used to treat the prophets. These are certainly disguised, very well disguised blessings. Choosing to be poor, hungry, sorrowful, hated, insulted, and slandered is not what most of us would do. And yet Jesus says those who walk these paths have every reason to be happy, to even leap for joy because of what lies ahead, because of what they will experience in the future. Uh, Jesus again begins in verse 20 speaking of those who are poor. Uh, there have been many discussions about whether Jesus was talking about those who were physically poor or about those who were spiritually impoverished. In, in Matthew 5, 3, Jesus almost certainly means the latter because he, he refers to those who are poor in spirit. And that clarification is, is from Jesus himself. A, a genuine dependence on God is what characterizes the poor in spirit. However, the reality is that those with little money, the financially poor, <laughs> often depend on God because uh, they can't depend on their own financial resources. One of the dangers of the material abundance many of us enjoy is that we forget how much we need God. We tend to think our food comes from the grocery store. Not from the Lord. Uh, of course, there are plenty of people who, who have no money who still try to be self-sufficient. And, and some billionaires realize they depend on God for every breath of air they breathe. Yet it would be foolish to deny that material wealth can often make it very hard to be poor in spirit. 
In verse 21, Jesus speaks of those who are hungry, which in Matthew he clarifies as those who hunger for righteousness. Those who weep are not so much those uh, crying because of personal sorrow, but those who grieve over the pervasive evil and suffering in the world. This includes, includes people who weep when they hear about famine and, and starvation in East Africa, <laughs> or about teenage sex slaves in Southern Asia, or about the hundreds of thousands of unborn children killed each year in our own country. Even more, it includes those like, like Jesus himself who weep over the spiritual darkness they see around them, realizing that billions, Billions have not experienced God's salvation through Jesus Christ. With many of them never even having heard of his name, that is indeed a reason for tears. In verse 22, Jesus then turns the focus to people being persecuted because of their faith. This ranges from those who are, are deeply hated because of their allegiance to Jesus, hated enough that they might, might actually be killed, to those who are occasionally insulted or, or laughed at because of their Christian faith, which probably includes many in this room. Now, again, none of the situations Jesus mentions are, are ones we would likely choose for ourselves. I sure don't want to be poor, hungry, weeping, or persecuted. In fact, most of us do pretty much anything we can to avoid those situations. And yet Jesus says, <laughs> if you're poor, be glad. <laughs> be, be glad, because one day in God's kingdom, you will inherit more wealth than you could ever imagine. If you're hungry, be glad, because one day you, you will feast at a banquet which will make prime rib and lobster look like dog food. If you're weeping now, be glad, because one day uh, the heartiest laugh you could ever imagine will pour from your soul. And if you're persecuted for your faith in Jesus, verse 23, rejoice and leap for joy. Take note, your reward is great in heaven. For this is the way their ancestors used to treat the prophets. In other words, if you're loyal and faithful to the Lord, <laughs> not everyone's going to be happy with you. So think about what a great privilege it is to be included in that faith hall of fames with others who have been persecuted because they were faithful to God. People like Moses and Elijah and Daniel, they persecuted them they're going to persecute you as well. Friends, these verses are really about hope. A, a word which ranks right up there with love as the most powerful four-letter word in our language. Hope. Uh, Churchill once said that, that hope was the most important weapon the British had in World War II. Hope is something everyone in this world, including everyone in this room, really does need. Paperboy was delivering his newspapers on a very cold, uh, uh, rainy day, and a customer met him at the door and said, Son, you must be pretty miserable out there today. Oh, I don't mind, mister, he said. I know the sun will shine again. And it will. And, and, and folks, that's, that's an illustration of biblical hope. A hope which is built not just on, on a wish, but on a warranted confidence. It is in contrast to a, a blind, often irrational optimism typified by Charlie Brown who said, I keep hoping yesterday will be a better day. That's not going to happen. Christian hope is a realistic confidence warranted by God's greatness and goodness. It's a confidence that no matter how difficult things are today, 
They will not always be that way. God will make things right. The sun will shine again. Friends, one of the most powerful sermons I've ever heard, <laughs> remembered very clearly, was uh, by Tony Campalo entitled, It's Friday, but Sunday's a coming. Now, there are many, many issues on which Tony and I strongly disagree, but on this, in this sermon, he did hit the nail on the head. He actually borrowed it from an old African-American preacher. <laughs> and, and one of the reasons I, I remember it is because the theme is so simple. On Friday, Jesus was on the Roman cross, covered with blood, <laughs> and very much dead. The disciples were discouraged, confused, and frightened. They were hiding from both the Jewish and Roman authorities. That was Friday. And yet by Sunday, things had been turned upside down. Jesus was uh, very much alive. He, 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 he was the risen Lord. And, and the disciples began to realize that their lives were being forever changed by that empty tomb. And the point of that sermon is this. No matter what your calendar says, today, if you're living in this earth, today is Friday. It's Friday. Though, though, though the sun may, may seem to be sh shining, it, it's actually pretty dark out there. There's a lot of discouragement, a lot of confusion, a lot of fear. A lot of people are grieving. You know, th th there are some folks, for example, who uh, they worked hard all week, <laughs> and yet when they got their check on Friday, it, it wasn't even enough to pay the bills that they have right now. And they, and they feel discouraged. Their children who went to bed last night and, and woke up a few hours later when Daddy came home drunk and was screaming at Mommy. There are folks that left the doctor's office this week terrified because they heard those words, the biopsy shows cancer. It's very much Friday. But <laughs> for God's people, Sunday is coming. Sunday is coming. One day uh, on the eternal Sunday, the poor are going to be rich, the hungry are going to be full, those, has, those who have been weeping are going to laugh, and those who have suffered for their faith in Jesus are going to be rewarded. Sunday is going to come, and the sun will shine brightly, and it will shine forever. And friends, that's the hope Jesus gives us. In these verses, it's a marvelous hope. But, but sometimes we're troubled by that phrase in verse 23. Your reward is great in heaven. And we wonder, do we, do we really have to wait until heaven? Is it only there that we'll be free from the, the suffering and, and hardship we find in this life? Well, yes, total freedom from suffering and hardship is something for which we have to wait. That's the not yet part of God's kingdom. Now, most of us aren't real excited about this because we're not exactly fond of waiting. We want faster and faster internet connections because we don't want to have to wait a few seconds for a movie to download. And yet often the Lord expects us to wait until heaven before we experience the fulfillment of his promises. And I do think that we, as sophisticated 21st century American Christians, can learn some things from the simple faith of African American slaves before the Civil War. Many of them were Christians. And they worked long hours in hot and humid cotton fields. 
and they would sing. They would sing, they would sing about heaven. They would sing some glad morning, when this life is o'er, I'll fly away. In the midst of their suffering, they sang. Well, friends, <laughs> I think you've noticed we ain't in heaven yet. There are all sorts of reminders of that around us. Yet we can still sing. We can still rejoice and even leap for joy for two reasons. Number one, because we know the delights of heaven await us. That that's what's up ahead. And secondly, the Lord is already giving us a taste his amazing love and grace. This is the already part of, of God's kingdom. We already have the Holy Spirit indwelling us and, and bringing comfort to our lives. We already experience the joy of Christian fellowship. In fact, many uh, experience that right now, today, in this building. A and then there's all the encouragement and guidance we receive as we read God's word. And folks, there are many other blessings from the Lord that, that are the, ours right now. These are, these are rays of sunshine breaking through the dark clouds and, and, and bringing joy to our lives this very day. And they are reminders of the great and pure joy which is ahead. When the sun will shine, or more accurately, when we won't even need the sun, because the light of God will illumine everything, and there will be no more darkness or night. Friends, some, some of you here this morning are believers in Jesus. You're, you're truly trusting in him for your salvation and yet, as you walk into this room today, you're hurting. You have scars, bruises, maybe even open wounds. Probably not on your body, maybe some on your body, but, but, but on your soul. Because this week you got beat up pretty good. Again, probably not literally, but, but figuratively. Figuratively. That there are all sorts of tensions and frustrations and disappointments and anxieties that have been part of your life recently. I, I am glad I can tell you, by God's grace, you will get through whatever challenge you're facing. By his grace, you will make it. And in his time, if you're trusting in him, he will bring healing to your soul. In, in fact, right now this morning, you can find comfort and joy as you remind yourself of the promises that God gives us in his word. And as you choose to believe those promises. And that includes the promises of our text today. The, the, the Lord Jesus came to this world to comfort those who are troubled. And he also came to trouble the comfortable. And that is what he does in verses 24 through 26. But woe to you who are rich, for you have received your comfort. Woe to you who are full now, for you will be hungry. Woe to you who are now laughing, for you will mourn and weep. Woe to you when all people speak well of you, for this is the way their ancestors used to treat the false prophets. Now, the word woe is not a curse. It's a, it's a warning. And it's, a good it's good to remember that Jesus means what he says. He's addressing people who are rich and full and, and laughing and receiving praise from other people. Yet, yet it's important to note a couple of underlying uh, assumptions Jesus appears to make. First, the people who are comfortable in this life, he assumes, have gotten that way because they've been taking advantage of others and have not been faithful to the Lord. I, I, now, I, that's not always true, but sometimes it certainly is, and that's an assumption he's making. Secondly, people who have everything they think they need 
tend not to depend on God. Again, there are certainly individuals who are rather wealthy, wealthy and live very comfortable lives, who depend on the Lord and are faithful to him. However, there are many people who think they are full, think they have things under control, think they've worked hard and they've made a good life for themselves, and they've decided, I don't really need God. I can do this on my own. Uh, they've adopted the old motto, God helps those who help themselves. Oh, well, that may sound nice, but it's not what the Bible teaches. And, and people who think this way really are not depending on the Lord. And, and Jesus' warning is this. If you are not depending on God, one day you will be in big trouble. Your wealth and your comfort are only temporary. Uh, the good life has a way of evaporating very quickly. Uh, an earthquake or hurricane or, or fire can change things in, in a matter of seconds. And many people who at one time had significant amounts of money have been forced to file for bankruptcy. And, and even if someone makes it through this life kind of in one piece, even if someone is a multimillionaire with a great marriage and wonderful children and many marvelous friends, and this person enjoys perfect health and dies in his or her sleep at age 99, even if that's the case, at that point, the point of death, a whole new issue arises. Because when we stand before God, those who have been relying on themselves rather than the Lord Jesus will understand why he spoke those woes. Whatever someone has achieved, all the wealth and success he's attained, all the friends and admirers she's accumulated, will mean absolutely nothing. The only thing that will matter is whether we're depending on the Lord, trusting in Jesus Christ instead of ourselves. And so, friend, are, are you depending on God's, grace, on God's grace provided for us in the Lord Jesus? Are you depending on God's grace provided for us in the Lord Jesus? There are a lot of important questions in life, but that one is at the top of the list. If you're not trusting in Jesus Christ, whoa, <laughs> whoa, there is a warning. Though the road you're traveling now may seem smooth, there is great danger ahead. In fact, if you don't turn around, there is destruction, eternal disaster in your future. The good news is it's not too late. If by God's grace you turn to the Lord Jesus, turn away from your self-righteousness and self-reliance and, and put your trust in him, you will be saved from eternal hell. If you're not sure what that means to trust in the Lord Jesus or, or you're not sure you're doing so, please make sure you talk to me later or Craig is going to be in the back uh, this morning and he'd be glad to talk to you as well. Uh, on the other hand, if you are trusting in Jesus Christ, <laughs> you can rejoice because no matter how dark things seem in your life today, there's reason for hope. God has promised and he, and he has sealed this promise with the blood of his own son. He has promised to bring all those who are believers in Jesus to a home, an eternal home, where there is no more death, sorrow, crying, or pain. He will bring us to a home where there is nothing but pure eternal joy. He promises in the midst of what can be a very difficult journey to bring us safely to that home. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for the promise is of your word. The promise is that those who are poor and hungry and mourning and persecuted 
are going to receive riches, <laughs> are going to be filled, are going to laugh and rejoice and, and experience great rewards. Lord, as we face really tough situations. I know some people here are, are dealing with cancer. Other people have loved ones who are, are so ill and, and knowing that life may end very soon. Others dealing with financial issues, family conflicts. Lord, just give your hope. By your word, through your spirit, give your hope each of this this morning, in Jesus' name.